the second lecture for the nervous system and the last bit of material before your lecture exam, which is on October 25th. So you have about a couple weeks, more or less, to go through this material and integrate it before we get to the exam. The study guide is already posted. It's been posted since yesterday. So please make sure you're looking through that and emailing me if you have any questions. In terms of what I'm expecting you to know for the exam and in general for this class, um, this uh, recording is gonna be a little bit different because it doesn't follow the chapters quite as clearly as um, other lectures usually do. Uh, so it kind of pulls from a lot of different chapters. And so we're gonna focus primarily on homeostasis, so kind of tying together some ideas that we've been talking about over the past few weeks with the endocrine system and homeostasis um, and kind of thinking about how the nervous system regulates our body in reaction to external input. Um, so we'll be thinking about the role of the spinal cord in maintaining homeostasis by propagating nerve impulses um, and then also integrating information. So thinking about the role of the central nervous system and then we'll also think about the peripheral nervous system, specifically the autonomic nervous system, um, thinking about uh, kind of autonomic reflexes, um, kind of going back also uh, introducing reflexes through the spinal cord, um, and then uh, getting into the autonomic nervous system, thinking about what we mean by parasympathetic versus sympathetic um, and homeostasis in that sense. Um, I also want to introduce vision ph physiology because you're going to be doing a whole lab on that and on reflexes after your lab exam. So uh, this Friday you have a normal lab and we're doing a study session during uh, my office hours. The following week is the lecture exam, then the following week is the lab exam, and then the week after that in early November uh, you have a lab that's reflexes and vision physiology. So this is the last uh, lecture kind of before that point, so I wanted to make sure that I give you some time to learn that information before you get to lab because you need to be putting in the work for lecture before you get to lab. Um, just to kind of backtrack for that, I will introduce, when we get to vis vision physiology, I'll introduce what I'm expecting you to know for uh, the lecture exam and for the lab. Um, so this lecture is pulling from chapters 12 through 16, uh, so again, it's not following through the sections of the chapters quite as neatly as it usually does, um, just because I wanted to focus on specific learning objectives that the book doesn't really flow with, um, so it'll be a little bit different. But we're going to start by talking about homeostasis, so the role of the nervous system in maintaining homeostasis by propagating impulses engaging with reflexes and the autonomic nervous system. So remember, when we talk about the nervous system, we have both anatomical and physiological, structural and functional distinctions. We have the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system, which is pretty much everything else um, and includes information flowing in from the external environment to that central nervous system. So going through sensory neurons, getting integrated in the central nervous system, and then information may be flowing back out through motor neurons as part of the somatic or autonomic nervous systems. Um, so, and those are uh, voluntary and involuntary responses respectively. When we refer to sympathetic and parasympathetic, those are uh, kind of divisions or types of responses that are typical of the autonomic nervous system and they balance one another out. When we're talking about functional divisions of the nervous system and more specifically um, kind of focusing on that interplay between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, we have again the somatic, which is voluntary, the autonomic, which is involuntary. And remember here on this slide, which you've seen before, we talked about how the effectors, the, um, the structural components of our body that are receiving that signal from the central nervous system, how they vary depending on whether it's somatic or autonomic. So with somatic, it's voluntary, so it usually tends to be skeletal muscles as those effectors um, that are innervated by the somatic nervous system. Um, and then for the autonomic nervous system, 
that tends to innervate stuff like smooth muscle and uh, cardiac muscle and glandular tissue that is uh, more involuntary. So we're going to focus first on the spinal cord, which remember is still part of the central nervous system. Although we think about the brain as being a primary integration center, the spinal cord also is very important for integration. Um, so we'll focus on its role in homeostasis. Remember that when we talk about homeostasis, we're thinking about a steady internal state within a given range that is maintained by feedback loops. So if we go in either direction outside of that range, we have to have these feedback loops in place to bring stuff back together, to balance out. Um, so when we talk about homeostasis, we're thinking about balance and kind of uh, these negative feedback loops that cancel one another out um, and maintain that homeostasis. So while we've talked about it in the context of the endocrine system before, the nervous system is also very important for maintaining homeostasis. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic in that role as well. So remember, when we have information coming in from the external environment, it has to go through the peripheral nervous system first. Um, it travels. Uh, the, well, let me not get ahead of myself. There's a stimulus um, that has to be present. Um, and just because there's a stimulus doesn't mean that we're perceiving it. Remember, it has to first bind to a receptor. Um, it has, there's those different graded potentials. It has to reach a threshold in order to be converted to an action potential that gets sent along and propagated along nerves. Um, and just because um, a stimulus is present and we receive it doesn't mean that we need to be reacting to it. Remember, uh, it has to meet that threshold. Um, it's good for stuff to sometimes not meet the threshold and for our brain to, even if we recognize it as a meaningful pattern, to not react to it, just because there's so many stimuli around us all the time. So the stimulus has to be present, has to bind to a receptor, it has to meet that threshold um, and convert it to a nerve impulse that has to be transduced and connected to the brain. Um, and our brain has to integrate it, translate it into a meaningful pattern and perceive it. And then we might be able to have a motor reaction to it. Um, so this is kind of this first um, afferent pathway. It's going from the outside into our deeper portions of our body, our brain, and our spinal cord, where we have integration occurring. So the spinal cord specifically maintains homeostasis by propagating nerve impulses along tracks. Um, so if you think back to anatomy, uh, remember that a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system is called a nerve, but that same bundle of axons, once it transfers into the central nervous system, is called a tract. We talked about that briefly last week when we talked about um, the uh, optical nerve, um, sorry, optic nerve and optic tract and how tricky that is because they're technically connected to each other. Um, so those si signals are coming in through our nerves. Um, when they reach our spinal cord, they get conducted along the spinal cord along tracks. Um, so the spinal cord continues that signal coming in, helps us you know, receive that information and make sure it gets to that integrating center. Um, and then it also has a role in actual integration of information. So it serves as an integration center specifically for some reflexes, which are fast involuntary sequences of actions in response to a stimulus. Um, so I will talk first about this part with the nerve impulses um, and propagating those. When I am talking about that, I'll have a little green um, explosion thing that, like with the number one in the top right corner of the slide. Um, so you can kind of keep track about when I'm talking about nerve impulse propagation, that role of the spinal cord. When I'm talking about the spinal cord actually integrating information and uh, carrying out reflexes, I'll have a little orange guy with the number two. Okay, so remember last week we talked about how um, different neurons can be classified by function. In anatomy, you classified them according to structure, but here we're thinking about what role do they play in sending signals? What direction are they sending them in? So if a neuron is afferent or sensory, it means that it's sending a signal from a receptor to the central nervous system.
Uh, if a neuron is efferent, then it's having an effect. It's sending a signal to an effector, like a muscle or a gland. That's a motor neuron. So it's sending the signal back out from the central nervous system to the effector. Some neurons uh, are connected together. And um, so that's one thing that I wanted to kind of take a moment to remind you. Uh, neurons can be really, really long. So we're going to look at pathways that stretch, stretch across uh, huge portions of our body where they're just three neurons in length. Um, remember that a lot of the axon uh, is just axoplasm with a membrane wrapped around it. So it doesn't have quite the same uh, biological demands and constraints that most cells do. Um, it is a different uh, interior um, and so it doesn't, uh, it's not quite as bound by that surface area to volume ratio problem that cells usually are bound by that limits their size. So it can be very thin and very long and still be all one cell. But sometimes neurons have to uh, connect to one another and so those are called association neurons or connecting neurons. So they transmit nerve impulses from neuron to neuron. So just to kind of help visualize that, um, if we have skin, which is involved in somatosensation, that touch reception, um, we can see that it's enervated with an afferent nerve. That signal is going to be sent from the, aff uh, from the skin along the afferent nerve to the spinal cord in this case, where integration is going to occur, and then a signal is going to be sent back out along an efferent nerve to the effector, which is in this case skeletal muscle. So we see the visual pathway of uh, that whole stimulus and reception and transduction process taking place before we even really get to the afferent nerve, then that signal being sent, we have integration, and then we have a motor response through the afferent nerve. So when we're thinking about these sensory and motory tracts within the spinal cord, that part of the central nervous system, um, we think about them being ascending or descending. And just like with most things in biology, there's a uh, pattern to the language that we can keep in mind. So when we look at the name of a sensory tract or a motor tract, um, the first part of the name tells you where the signal is starting and the second part of the name tells you where the signal is ending. So that helps you determine direction. So for example, if the first part of the name is inferior to the second part, then that means that it's sensory because the signal is ascending. If the first part of the name is superior to the second part, that means that it's a motor tract um, because the signal is descending. So I'm going to point out a couple of main sensory pathways and a couple of main motor uh, pathways that are involved with the spinal cord. So some major sensory ascending pathways are the dorsal column system and the spinothalamic tract. Um, the dorsal column system is really involved with uh, somatosensation, so touch sensation and proprioception, body positioning, um, it's also called the dorsal column medial lemniscus tract. Um, so the dorsal column, like the dorsal root ganglion, um, we'll see a picture of that on the next slide. So that's at kind of the base of the spine. Um, and then the medial lemniscus is part of the brain. So we see that it's going from the lower spine up to the brain, uh, so it's ascending. And you might also see this referred to as the posterior column, Dorsal column, dorsal column, medial lemniscus tract, posterior column, all mean the same thing. The spinothalamic tract is responsible for uh, pain and te uh, temperature sensation. So also kind of somatosensation, but slightly different from just touch and body position. Um, and so when we're thinking about that one, um, spinothalamic going from the spine, also the dorsal root ganglion up to the thalamus, you can see that it's ascending. So for both of these, just in terms of the word, as well as this visual image right here, we see that the nerve impulse is ascending. So it's sensory. It's sending information from the environment around it up to the uh, central nervous system. So for both of these, they're sending information from the dorsal root ganglion to the thalamus, because even though that dorsal column system passes through the medial lemniscus, it gets to the thalamus.
Um, so each of these pathways, it turns out, is composed of three neurons. So again, you're going across a big distance of your body, but only three cells. For the major motor uh, pathways, which are descending, we can divide these into direct motor pathways and indirect motor pathways. Um, I'm going to talk to you about these distinctions. Uh, when I first made this slide, I had a whole list of examples of direct motor pathways and indirect motor pathways. We're not going to stress about it. It's not anatomy. I'd rather you understand the function of these uh, than try to get into the nitty gritty of which one is which. So these direct motor pathways are more uh, involved with voluntary movement. So they propagate nerve impulses from your brain uh, to these effectors like skeletal muscle that are responsible for voluntary movement. Indirect is responsible primarily for involuntary movement. So again, these are motor pathways. They're sending messages along an efferent uh, pathway to the effector. Um, so in this case, the effectors are smooth muscle and glandular tissue. Uh, sometimes these are involved with skeletal muscle as well, but it's all involuntary responses. Another term for the direct motor pathways is pyramidal pathways. Another term for the indirect motor pathways is extrapyramidal pathways. So it's just something else you might see it referred to as. So to visualize that motor uh, pathway, this one is the corticospinal tract. Um, so you can see that it's descending from the cerebral cortex to the spine. So it's a motor pathway, and this is an example of a direct motor pathway. So it's involved in voluntary movement. You can see the signals being sent out to skeletal muscles. All right, so we're going to think now about reflexes, um, and I'm sure we all have experiences with reflexes. These are fast, involuntary, unplanned sequences of actions that predictably occur in response to a particular stimulus. But there's a lot of differences between different types of reflexes. Um, so, for example, some of them are somatic, others are autonomic or visceral. Some are innate. Um, these really cute GIFs over on this right side uh, depict what's called the Maro or startle reflex, which is something that infants are born with. Um, whenever they change their body position, they reach their hands out like they're shocked, like, how could you do this to me? Um, but and they're like they're trying to balance themselves. That's the moral reflex, but by a certain point, babies grow out of it. Um, and around that time, you usually stop swaddling them. Swaddling often helps um, control the moral reflex. They like that proprioception, that kind of feeling of closeness. Um, so that is kind of why it helps them sleep. Um, but at a certain point, they outgrow the moral reflex. They don't have it anymore. Uh, so the benefits kind of change. Um, other reflexes are don't go away, and then some of them are learned. Um, like for example, when we start driving, we pick up a lot of reflexes that way. Some are spinal, so they um, the integration happens entirely within the spinal column, the spinal cord. Others are cranial, so they're sent around, uh, sent through cranial nerves, and integration happens um, in the brain. So regardless of the type of reflex, there's a very basic type of pathway that information flows through into, through, and out of the central nervous system um, as part of a reflex. So we call this a reflex arc or a reflex circuit. Um, this image is depicting the patellar reflex, which is like a knee jerk. Um, and so it has the little hammer uh, coming at the patella. And so that's going to be where you have your sensory receptor that's going to send a signal um, along a sensory neuron. And so that's depicted here in blue. Um, that's going to make its way to an integrating center, which is here, the spinal cord. That's going to send information back out along a motor neuron. So we have our afferent and inferent, efferent pathways. Um, and then we're gonna get to the effector, which in this case is the quadriceps muscle and the hamstring muscle. Your quadriceps is going to contract, your hamstring is going to relax and extend, um, and then you have your uh, foot swinging upward as a result.
So you might have heard before about damage to one side of the brain affecting the other side of the body. Um, and that's the case when you have um, relationships that are established with spinal nerve systems. So they're what we call contralateral. That means that the right side of the body is connected to the left side of the brain through these spinal nerves. Um, but if information is flowing through a cranial nerve, then that relationship is what we call ipsilateral. So the right side of the head, for example, is connected to the right side of the brain because the right side of the head, um, like the non-brain parts of the head, are innervated by cranial nerves. So I just wanted to show you a couple of visuals of some important diagnostic reflexes. Um, on the left is the patellar reflex that I mentioned. Um, that one is so common that like we call something that is immediate a knee-jerk reaction. So um, that's a very common reflex. There's also the Achilles reflex, which involves hammering the Achilles tendon, and you can watch it here. So the back of the foot kind of raises and the toe lowers in response. That's an ankle jerk. There's also the plantar reflex or the Babinski sign. Um, so when you're an adult, if you make this motion, then you have the toes curling down in flexion. Um, but then if uh, you have certain neurological problems or you're an infant, you have what's called the Babinski sign where that same motion and um, stimulus results in the toes fanning outward and upward. Um, then there's also the pupillary light reflex, which is an autonomic reflex. Um, so when you shine a light on someone's eyes, the pupil constricts in reaction to it, and it should happen the same on both pupils at the same time with the same stimulus. Um, and so there's actually muscles that are uh, controlling the size of that pupil, of that hole in the middle of the iris. So when we're thinking about those reflex arcs for autonomic reflexes, they're slightly structurally different. Um, so remember we talked about that basic flow of efferent and afferent pathways, I'm sorry, afferent and efferent, I should do it in order, um, for reflex arcs in general, um, but for autonomic reflexes, it's a little bit different. So for the somatic system, um, it's a little bit more straightforward, but when we have an autonomic efferent pathway, so going from the integrating center uh, in the central nervous system to the effector, there's actually a ganglionic neuron in the center. Um, so there's a ganglion that separates it out, so we have a pre-ganglionic neuron and a, or axon and a post-ganglionic axon. Um, there's some differences between the so, um, different branches of the autonomic, so the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic in terms of the relative lengths of those pre- and post-ganglionic structures, um, but just know that um, it's a slightly different pathway or reflex arc if it's an autonomic reflex. So when we're thinking about homeostasis and we're thinking about these autonomic systems that are in place, homeostasis is often a balance between fight or flight or freeze, and which is sympathetic, and rest and digest, which is parasympathetic. Um, so we're kind of balancing out those two different branches of the autonomic nervous system. And when we look at innervation throughout the body, we have what's called dual innervation. So most organs in the body are serviced by neurons, by nerves um, from uh, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nervous system divisions. Um, so remember parasympathetic and uh, is has um, nerves coming from like the cranial nerves um, as well as the sacral nerves so it's like sacrocranial um, and then the sympathetic is also called um, lumbar thoracic because it has spinal nerves coming from the lumbar and thoracic regions um, but here we have this image where you see that your eye your salivary glands your lungs your heart different parts of your di digestive system, the bladder, the genitalia, all of those are serviced by these nerves coming from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So when we're thinking about um, effectors, so those different organs um, and the, specifically the glandular tissue and smooth muscle of those organs, um, that we have signals being sent by neurotransmitters. 
Um, so for example, we have acetylcholine and norepinephrine. We've talked about those a little bit in previous nervous system and endocrine system lectures. And we're gonna focus on those two specifically because they're what we call competing neurotransmitters. So uh, if you think way back to when we talked about the cardiac conduction system and those pacemaker cells and the sinoatrial node, um, part of the regulation of that pace that is set is set by the autonomic nervous system and neurotransmitter signals. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through a couple different examples of that with acetylcholine and norepinephrine. When norepinephrine is released onto pacemaker cells, it binds to what's called an adrenergic receptor. Um, the cells depolarize faster. And so remember, uh, depolarization moves uh, towards the threshold away from resting membrane potential um, towards an action potential or nerve impulse. And so in this case, you have the heart rate increasing. Acetylcholine, on the other hand, when it's released onto pacemaker cells, binds to muscarinic receptors and the cells hyperpolarize. So they can't reach their threshold as easily. It's inhibitory. Um, so then the heart rate decreases. So in this case, norepinephrine is acting as a sympathetic uh, neurotransmitter and acetylcholine is acting as a parasympathetic neurotransmitter. Another example um, is the action of your pupils. Um, so we'll talk about this when we talk about vision physiology, um, but when dim light is perceived, that initiates a sympathetic response where the pupils dilate. Um, and then if bright light is perceived, that initiates a parasympathetic response in which the pupils constrict. So dilation allows you to take in more light and process more about your surroundings. Um, if you have plenty of light, if you're safe, you don't are not you're not as reliant on vision, um, and so your pupils constrict. They don't have to take in as much from their surroundings. This isn't a completely perfect balance at all times. Um, sometimes the resting or steady state of an organ or organ system actually tends towards one of these branches. Um, so for example, we talked about that cardiac conduction system and it turns out that that mechanism with acetylcholine and the parasympathetic nervous system, that state of rest and controlled heartbeat, resting heart rate um, is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. So we say that the autonomic tone is more parasympathetic. Um, it's controlled by that vagus nerve, the decreasing heart rate. So thinking about some classical examples of the sorts of reactions associated with the parasympathetic nerves and the sympathetic nerves, when we have parasympathetic, that's more rest and digest, feed and breed. So you tend to have constricted pupils, a slower heart rate, constricted airways, your stomach activity is stimulated and your glucose um, release is inhibited. Uh, so if you think way back to when we talked about digestive physiology and different metabolic states, here um, you have just eaten, you have plenty of dietary glucose, uh, you don't need to go through glycogenolysis, you can start actually um, building up glycogen, so uh, glycogenesis, you don't have to go through gluconeogenesis because you have plenty of glucose, um, so this kind of relates back to that digestive physiology as well. Um, and then sexual arousal is also stimulated. So this is sometimes called feed and breed, um, kind of the uh, things that you can do when you're already safe. Um, but for sympathetic nerves, this is fight or flight. Um, so your pupils tend to dilate, you have increased heart rate, relaxed airways, inhibited stomach activity. Um, you are stimulating glucose release, so glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Um, your adrenaline is secreted, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, it also promotes ejaculation and vaginal contractions. Um, so this is kind of um, the stuff that is like, if you're in a scary tense situation, these are the types of autonomic reactions you might have. Um, this also affects your salivary glands. So if you are feeding and resting and digesting, that increases salivary flow. If you are anxious, giving a presentation in front of the class and your mouth is really dry, that's because you're having a sympathetic nervous system response and that's decreased salivary production.
Okay, so now we're going to move on to thinking uh, uh, kind of broadly about special senses, but more specifically about vision physiology. Um, so here, this is to prepare for lab on November 8th on reflexes and vision physiology, but I will ask a couple of questions on the exam. So you should be able to distinguish between general senses and special senses. Um, you should understand the relationship between photopigments, second messengers, which we'll briefly review, membrane polarization, and release of inhibitory neurotransmitters. Um, so this vision physiology kind of brings together a lot of topics that we've been talking about over the past few weeks. Um, and then kind of very broadly, you should know the general steps involved in vision physiology, which I've summarized on slide 47. So as we go through these, I'm going to introduce uh, the general senses and special senses. I'll introduce vision, and then I'll have a few slides for each step. And then all of the steps are summarized on the last slide, slide 47. So when we're thinking about sensory modalities, those different sense systems that can help us you know, interpret um, and perceive information from our environment, they pick up that, those stimuli and then kind of help send them into our central nervous system for integration. Um, if it's a general sense, that means that there are receptors throughout the body in many different organs. So somatosensation is a key example of this. Um, but if it's a special sense, that means that we have one specific organ dedicated to that sensory modality. So for example, the eye with vision, uh, the inner ear with audition, which is hearing, and equilibrium, which is balance, the tongue for gustation, which is taste, and the nose for olfaction, which is smell. So those are all examples of special senses. So vision is what we're going to be focusing on. And by vision, we mean a special sense that is based on the transduction of light stimuli received through the eye. So we talked about those pressure gated channels, which respond to touch with changes in the plasma membrane. We've talked a lot about different receptors that bind to, um, for example, uh, different volatile molecules for olfaction. Um, but here we're thinking about how light is able to actually cause structural changes in different components of our cells and have transduction of that response. And that's happening in the eye. So the eye is the dedicated organ for this special sense. Um, and when we look at key structures of the eye, a lot of what we think of are these kind of external structures that are really more for protection. Um, so the orbits of the eyes, the eyelids, eyelashes, and eyebrows, um, the conjunctiva, uh, the lacrimal gland and duct, which are involved with tears, all of those are very important for protecting the eye. Um, the eye is definitely a portal of entry for pathogens, so we need, um, you know, and it's very sensitive in that way, um, so we need a lot of structures to kind of keep stuff out of our eyes. The eye also has a lot of muscles surrounding it and inside of it to kind of help move it around and respond to light levels. Um, so a lot of muscle groups move the eye around and are responsible for that pupillary reflex. There's a lot of structures that are involved in vision, and I put this here kind of as a reminder from anatomy. You definitely don't need to know all of these, but I just want to remind you that the cornea and the iris are important for regulating light entry. Um, the lens refracts light. Um, the uh, ciliary body is important for lens shape, uh, and the retina is really key for receiving that light, um, going through transduction, so converting it to receptor potentials and sending that nerve impulse into the brain through the optic nerve. So those are the structures that we'll really focus on. So we're going to start out by thinking first about step one, which is image formation. So how does light, how does that image actually get into our eye? Um, and so when light passes uh, through an object or off of an object and through our eyes, it is refracted or bent by the lens and the cornea. And that image is actually inverted and horizontally flipped. Um, but it turns out that our brain learns to correct them. So even though it's coming into our brain um, totally disoriented uh, from a very young age, within a few days, we learn how to correct that image.
So when we're thinking about the lens, um, we think about this idea of accommodation, which uh, means that the lens increases in curvature. Um, and so this allows us to see up close because it also increases light refraction. Um, so being able to curve that lens is really important for seeing up close. Um, if we have problems with uh, with uh, different types of vision, if we have astigmatism, a lot of this comes down to the lens that's actually inside of our eye having a problem with its curvature. Um, and this idea of the near point of vision means the minimum distance from the eye that an object can be focused um, with maximum accommodation. So for a lot of us, that's about 10 centimeters. So in order for that light to get into our eye at the specific point um, where it's really going to maximize hitting our retina, um, we're able to control the size of our pupil um, and the iris that surrounds it. Um, so the iris has circular muscle fibers that are able to constrict or dilate the pupil. Um, constricting lets le less light through, um, dilating lets more light through um, at different angles. Uh, and that pupil is the name for that hole in the iris through which light enters. And remember, when this happens in response to a light source, it's an autonomic reflex. So the next step involves what actually happens when the light hits the retina. Um, and so it, it's hitting us these sensory cells called rods and cones that are in the retina, um, and it's absorbed by photopigments. So there are these special pigments that are associated with light. Um, and there's a few different types. So our rods have a particular photopigment called rhodopsin. The cones have blue, green, and red pigments. And if we look at this plot, um, the y-axis is showing us maximum absorbance of light from these pigments. And then the, uh, sorry, the y-axis is showing us that, and the x-axis axis is showing us different wavelengths. Um, so you can see that the blue cones are going to absorb blue light the best, the green cones are going to absorb green light the best, the red cones are absorbing red light, um, and then the rods are absorbing this uh, between green and blue region pretty well. Um, so they overlap with one another and we're able to see different colors of light um, and absorb it uh, through those pigments. So that means that they're able to absorb the, uh, those wavelengths um, and then the pigments have a structural change in response. That being said, if we are only using rods or only using cones, um, then that's going to change uh, the clarity of the picture as well as the colors that we're seeing. So those photopigments have a particular structure. They are a glycoprotein called an opsin with a retinol, which is a light absorbing vitamin A derivative. Um, and when the light hits these pigments, the structure changes in a very cyclical way. Um, so it has this cis trans uh, transition, um, and then there's uh, this bleaching that occurs. Um, so after bleaching occurs, the photopigments have to be regenerated before they can be used again. So if we're thinking about the role of these photopigments in light and in dark, um, when it's light out, or when you're going from a dark environment to a light environment, um, the, your, your photo system or your visual system adjusts by quickly decreasing sensitivity very, very quickly. So going from dark to light, your pupils suddenly constrict, um, you have this really sudden change. Um, and there's also a change with the uh, photopigments as well. If you're going from the light to the dark, then it's a longer process. Um, so you're increasing sensitivity very rapidly, but then very slowly to get it all the way there. So light adaptation or going into light increases rates of bleaching, dark adaptation decreases rates of bleaching. Um, and with light adaptation, you have all this bleaching occurring very quickly, but the tricky thing is that rhodopsin doesn't regenerate very quickly. So you have it bleaching out and not being regenerated, um, but the 
I think it says, it says once, but it's supposed to say cone, sorry, that was a typo, that cone pigments uh, do regenerate quickly. So that's very useful for daylight vision. We tend to use our cones quite a bit when we're seeing during the day, because even though they're bleaching out really quickly, they also regenerate quickly. Um, the cone pigments regenerate during the first eight minutes or so of uh, dark adaptation, but then after that point, it's really rhodopsin that is being used more often. Um, and the kind of threshold is a little bit different. The way that the signal is uh, transduced is different. Um, and so in this case, uh, the, the reason we see um, kind of uh, stuff around us as being in grayscale more so, we don't see colors at night, has to do with this change, the shift from cones to rods at nighttime or in the dark. So after we have that structural change in the photopigment, we have what's called phototransduction. Um, and I just want to briefly introduce this cyclic GMP. Remember when we talked about endocrine systems, we talked about second messengers in relation to those hydrophilic uh, hormones that are, have to bind to um, external or extracellular receptors. Um, so cyclic AMP, we talked about in that case, this is cyclic GMP, which is another second messenger that's derived from guanosine triphosphate instead of adenosine triphosphate. So it's similar in structure. Um, and so this is going to build up in certain situations and be broken down in others. So this image is showing you uh, the situation at the membrane of um, rods specifically in this case um, and how that relates to the cyclic GMP and neurotransmitters. So I'll walk you through this process in darkness and then this process in light. So in darkness, you have a high cyclic GMP uh, built up, so a high concentration of cyclic GMP. That's going to allow sodium to come into the cell. So it keeps those channels open. Sodium is entering the cell, which keeps the membrane depolarized. So it's uh, higher, it's more positive, less negative than resting. It's at minus 40 millivolts. Remember, resting is about minus 70. Um, so that means that it's really easy to get to depolarization to threshold and it keeps the voltage gated calcium channels open. Um, remember we talked about how uh, when that depolarization happens towards the synaptic cleft, um, the vesicles move towards the end and release neurotransmitters. A similar thing is happening here. So depolarization is keeping those calcium channels open. The neurotransmitter in this case is glutamate, which is an amino acid, and it's constantly being released, but it turns out that it's inhibitory. So it hyperpolarizes neurons. It has an inhibitory postsynaptic effect um, or postsynaptic potential, and signals don't get sent on. So Glutamate is released, it's inhibitory when we have this high cyclic GMP situation in darkness due to the shape or uh, inactivity of the rhodopsin. But when light activates that rhodopsin and causes that structural change, it also, also activates a G protein called transducin, which causes cyclic GMP to be broken down. That stops the flow of sodium ions in um, and stops depolarization. Instead, the membrane hyperpolarizes and those voltage-gated calcium channels close. Um, that stops neurotransmitter release proportionally to the amount of light. So the more light you have, uh, the less neurotransmitters are released and the more action we have coming out of that. So the ganglion cells are stimulated and form action potentials because you don't have this inhibition taking place anymore. So after that, the action potential is sent along the visual pathway, which includes the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the optic tract. So going from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system, the thalamus, the primary visual area in the occipital lobe, the visual association area in the occipital, parietal, and temporal lobes. So to summarize, Step one, the image is formed through controlled light refraction, which we see in the graphic on the right. Step two, those photopigments in the retina change in shape and structure when the light hits them, which has a functional effect um, by hyperpolarizing the membrane and stopping inhibitory neurotransmitter release. 
After that, the action potential uh, is propagated along the visual pathway. Okay, so that's this last lecture uh, before the lecture exam. So please make sure you're going back and reviewing the other lectures, that you're working your way through the study guide, and let me know if you have any questions.